All right, I want to welcome you all to the second installment of Local Spins Live at River City Studios. It's a special showcase of West Michigan's emerging and burgeoning talent. I'm John Sinkovich of localspins.com, and uh, the website that documents the region's music scene through stories and video and photos and commentary. And I'm absolutely thrilled tonight that we get a chance to spotlight the Traverse City Bluegrass duo of Billy Strings and Don Julen with special guest Kevin Gills on bass. Um, I can assure you that this is going to be a rare and rousing night. I've seen these guys perform many times, and this is one reason why they're here tonight. Uh, this performance and interview session, as you can see, is being recorded for posterity, video, photos, and audio. And you'll be able to actually share this with your friends on a podcast at localspins.com later this month. Uh, if you keep track of Local Spins, you'll see when it gets posted with uh, all of the uh, marvelous things that are being done here. Uh, our first Local Spins Live at River City podcast uh, took place a couple months ago with Ghost Heart, an amazing atmospheric rock band from Grand Rapids, and the results were astonishing. I was so impressed with what everyone did, not only the band, but also those folks that are responsible for putting this together. Uh, that's due in large part to the brain trust, the talents of River City Studios, uh, Roy Wallace and Austin Rustorfer, and of course Jackie Helt, who probably really runs the show out front. And as well as the efforts of an amazing team of this Grand Valley students who are taking video of this tonight. Uh, the idea behind the series really, from my perspective, was not only to highlight some amazing talent that we've got here in Grand Rapids, Traverse City, Kalamazoo, and elsewhere in Michigan, but also to give these guys sort of their due. They get a really wonderful video out of this. It's really important for us to really uh, pay more attention to what some of these bands are doing, and I think this is a great way to do that. And it's a lifetime, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for you folks in the audience to see a band like this up close and personal with the audio and the, and the visual thing that you're going to get tonight. It's really something special, and you're part of the audience, so we want you to cheer after the songs. Don't be afraid, uh, you know, once they're done playing, to really let, it, let them hoot, hoot and holler, because that's what bluegrass is all about. Uh, as for the format for tonight's podcast, uh, I'll interview the band, and in between, they'll be playing some songs. Uh, near the very end, I'll give you guys a chance to ask some questions, too, because I think it's important for you guys to maybe get some things that you want to hear about uh, Billy Strings and Don Julen. Um, and I'd like to invite you all afterwards to go to Speakeasy Lounge. We usually use that place just down the street here on Monroe Avenue as sort of our post-podcast party. Now it's an honor for me to introduce Billy Strings and Don Julen. Um, I've described these guys in my story as a cross-generational pairing that uncorks sizzling bluegrass with sweat-drenched rock and roll vigor. And, <laughs> and one publication described them, quote, as the unholy child of Pantera and Tony Rice. And anybody that's seen these guys can really attest to that. In addition to sparking a buzz nationally, uh, they've toured with the legendary Del McCurry and David Grisman and literally have created a sensation across the region. They've done this in an amazingly short period of time. They've released two albums already, 2013's Rock of Ages, 2014's live recording, Fiddle Tune X, which is my favorite at this point. As an example of this meteoric rise, they also recently were chosen to appear at the prestigious Ann Arbor Folk Festival later this month, and that is a pretty big deal. Uh, it's an unlikely pairing. It's a guitarist who's now in his early 20s and a, a veteran mandolin player in his 50s and they, uh, who met at a coffee house in Traverse City a couple of years ago. They got together, rehearsed once, and, and the rest, as they say, is history. So I want to start by asking each of you two guys, um, what is it about bluegrass music that inspires you and why is it that audiences, as of late, over the last five or six years, have really responded to this acoustic very up-tempo sort of uh, genre, because I've really noticed a lot of younger audiences now are really responding to it. Well, I, I, I don't know. There seems like there's this really cool movement going on in music here in America now, where there's what they're calling it Americana, and I think it, in, it includes rock and roll and blues and soul music and R&B, and on the countryside, it includes traditional country and bluegrass and and somehow, you know, there's this really cool movement going on introducing the, the, the next generation to this great American music. And bluegrass falls into that category. And I think that's what it is. I think, you know, I mean, if you could say the same thing about a, you know, a traditional country singer, you know, someone who sounded like Merle Haggard. I mean, it would be, people would be interested in that now. And I can't tell you exactly why. Sure. You know, maybe, there, maybe for the last few years, music has been a little too... I don't know what. Sterile. Well, I don't know. You use whatever word you want. 
but but I think maybe that in this whole kind of turn back to you know bands with guitars and drums and bass and horns and mandolins and you know I think you know I feel great about it that people are excited about that music. So Billy, what what is it for you? Why why do you get so excited about playing this music? I mean, you 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 can't help yourself because you're playing before the show starts and you're playing everything you can imagine. Uh, ever since I was a little kid, that's all I wanted to do was play. So, uh, you know, to me, bluegrass is a music that's earthy and organic. You know, it's not you can't. I mean, you can learn it from a book. Maybe you can learn the tunes and stuff, but if you don't have the soul and the feeling of it, you. You know, to me, you're not playing it. It's kind of just a, there's a whole feeling behind it, you know. It's lonesome and it's uh, it's really special music to me. I grew up listening to it, you know. But as far as why do I think there's this whole revival thing going on right now, it always happens. You know, if you think about in the 60s, uh, the same thing happened, you know. Uh, with, uh, you know, for a while there, it was all rock and roll. Elvis, you know, was right. the was the best thing and the drums and the electric stuff. But then in the 60s, you know, everybody kind of started, they wanted to hear acoustic music again. They were tired of all the loud racket and all the hippies wanted to hear dirt music, you know, stuff yeah, that came from the life. ground. So I think that's just, you know, that's happening again. And well, because it's just great music. Well, you grew up in Ionia. We were talking a little yeah. bit about that. And you grew up in a family that played a lot. So you guys would sit around and play music together. Is that right? Absolutely, yeah. That's what we did around the house, you know. And like for parties, uh, bluegrass, folk, what kind of music was it? Well, a lot of bluegrass, you know. We played lots of bluegrass. When I was young, I was always, you know, there was always picking parties at my house and stuff. But but my dad, um, which is who's my main influence, um, you know, he can just play anything. He's, you know, he plays a lot of Beatles and classic rock tunes and stuff like that. But no, we played, you know, it was Doc Watson and... Bill Monroe and, you know, Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs and those guys that I was listening to when I was little. And, uh, well, none of the other kids my age were. <laughs> so did you pick up, what? how old were you when you picked up a guitar? I was four years old when I got my first real guitar. <laughs> uh, but when I was three, I had a plastic one and a pick. It was had, you know, had buttons on it and bat took batteries and stuff. And that's how it all began. Right, yeah, I got my right hand started out. Didn't you recently get one that takes batteries and has buttons on right. it? Yeah, I sure did. <laughs> now, Don, you actually, interestingly <laughs> enough, you play the mandolin, but you actually came around to bluegrass music a little bit later. It wasn't necessarily what you started with, right? Well, I played jazz and a variety of music for many years. That's how I made my living for the last bunch of years. And yeah, I mean, it's not like I didn't like bluegrass or anything like that. Um, I think it was because more... Because how could that be true? How could that be true? <laughs> No, I, I just uh, ended up, I fell into a crowd of people that played stuff with more jazz type of harmony and have spent many years doing that. I always admired bluegrass. I just never got, um, I never met anybody quite like that before, I guess. So so when we met, it was like, wow, this is really my opportunity to really dig into this stuff. Let's do it. So, so let's do it. Yeah, let's let's quit gabbing a little bit and have you guys play a little music for these folks. What are you going to play for us? To We're going to have Don pick pick one here for us and uh he wrote this tune it's called the albino skunk and we named this tune after a, a little festival down in south carolina that we played at so i'd like to give a little shout out to ziggy and the folks down at the albino skunk bluegrass festival too right here let's go don you ready boys
you know, I've had a chance to watch you guys perform a lot, and it's not just about the incredible musicianship that you guys bring, but it's also about the energy. I've been there late at night when you guys are completely balls of sweat and people are cheering and, and getting right on top of you on Man. stage. How much of this is improvisation? How much of this is like on the spur of the moment kind of stuff? I don't know, a, you know, no percentage, but a lot of it is. You know, we know how the tunes go, kind of. We kind of know how the songs go that we're playing, and that's that's about all we got. You know, we kind of just, we know the way the songs are going to go, the verse, the chorus, or whatever. Or if it's an instrumental tune, we know the melody, and we just say, you guys ready? One, two, three, four, here we go, and just hang on. The thing is, we're listening to each other. It's kind of a conversation we're having. That sounds like a lot like jazz to me, that you're doing the same kind of thing. You come from a jazz background. Yeah. Is there some similarities between jazz and bluegrass in that way? We kind of take a jazz approach maybe to bluegrass material. Some of the songs are kind of the same every time, but if you've seen us enough times to know that anything can happen in any song, and you know, at any moment could be this big long jam that lasts 10 minutes and ends up in a completely different song than where we started. And I think that kind of um, freedom to improvise, that, I think that's the... That's what really attracted me to playing with Billy is that's that really that we kind of, yeah <laughs> we we you know somehow we we just go out on a limb and and for the most part you usually get back and do you always um, do you, you must have fallen off a few times right? oh, yeah. of course yeah. yeah that's probably I think you know I think that's that's All the most the exciting part yeah, yeah some, some people refer to that as the NASCAR effect that's why they come to see us nobody goes to watch the cars go around they want to see a wipeout. <laughs> they want to see the. They want to hope nobody gets hurt, but they want to see a wipeout. And, 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 I imagine the line. audiences inspire you too, because all that hooting and hollering, and there's a certain feeling among among oh, the audience. Oh, that's it, right? man. You know, when I'm on stage and there's people screaming at me, I'm like, yeah, all right, let's do it, man. Let's have a party. And do you guys? Uh, how much do you split between traditional music and your own music? Because you guys have done both, right? We do a lot of songs that are public domain and old bluegrass songs, you know. But uh, we've been recently trying to write a lot more of our own stuff. And you have another album in the works potentially, because now you've already put there's out a, two. There's a very small seed <laughs> that is yet to be watered and flourished into a beautiful, blossoming thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Billy, if you had to name a few influences in the bluegrass Doc realm, Watson. Who, who, Doc Watson, without even hesitating. What do you want me to say, man? Doc Watson, my father, you know, uh, Bill Monroe, but that, all of them, Ralph Stanley and Lester and Earl and Doc and Merle, man, those are the dudes. How about you? Have you you've done a little more studying of it maybe uh, since you... Uh, bluegrass heroes or mandolin way, heroes? or what? Because I know you like Led Zeppelin, too. Well, yeah. Who doesn't? Yeah, yeah. we do. No, he does, all too. All those guys, man. No, Del McCurry, uh, David Grisman. Yeah. They're I all know. our heroes. Yeah, know? I, I kind of came into the mandolin in, a, in like in the late 70s, early 80s, and there was kind of like this new uh, jam band, new grass revival, David Grisman, and Older in the Way had, had recorded in the 70s. And that's kind of how I got introduced into this music was kind of through the maybe through the hippie door. And then it was after listening to those guys for a while, I realized who they w learned it from. But no, I, you know, David Grisman and Peter Rowan and Tony Rice and those guys, that's, that's, that's who turned me on to this kind of music. So you guys had a chance to tour with Dell and Dog out east and throughout yeah. the Midwest. What was that experience like? Because I think a lot of people who, you know, get the chance to tour with a, a, an artist who you've respected for so long you might be daunted by it but i saw videos of you guys all four of you on stage having a ball it was uh it was cool i was <laughs> i was floating above myself watching myself sing with del mccurry that's what was happening <laughs> well someday somebody some folks will do that with you guys so I, I i'm gonna have you guys play a couple of songs in a row here uh you can introduce them any way you want and tell little stories behind it if you'd like that's great
honey baby now I ain't got no honey baby now It's all I can do, it's all I can say I sing it to you, mama, next payday I sing it to you, mama, next payday one here uh, that I wrote called Dust in the Baggy. We hope you all enjoy it. I ain't slept in seven days I have an eight and three Methamphetamine has got a damn good hold of me My tweaking friends have got me to the point of no return I just put the lighter to the bulb and watch it burn This life of sin It's got me in but it's got me back in prison once again Well, I used my only phone call to contact my daddy I got 20 long years for some dust in the baggie Up in prison, troubled in the head But I took that little pop and sucked until my mind was spun I got 20 years to sit and think of what I've done This life of sin, it's got the end But it's got the back in prison once again Well, I used my own phone call to contact my daddy I got 20 long years for some dust in the bag It's got me in, but it's got the 
It's got me back in prison once again Well, I used my own phone call to contact my daddy I got 20 long years for some dust in a baggie So is there an explanation for the chemistry that happened between you guys, or is it organic? <laughs> it's, organic. It's music. It grows in the ground. Yeah, it's, it's just music. It's one of those things that music, it's one of the magic things music can do. I got a brand new little niece, man. She's not even a year old yet. Her name's Jimmy. I love her to death, and... and uh, she loves Jethro Tull, man. <laughs> she does. I mean, she never heard nobody tell her how to dance or whatever, but she dances. She don't know what dancing is, and she dances. She don't even know how to talk. You know, she just started learning how to walk, but she can jam out to some Ian Anderson. She loves it. What's your favorite record? Aqualong. Oh, I would guess. <laughs> so, you know, how many hours... <laughs> yeah, yeah. How could you not like that? What's when you were wrong? learning how to play, and maybe even now, how many hours a day do you play guitar? Uh, I bet you I play at least an hour a day. If I'm home, I'm going to pick up something. You know, I got instruments laying all around my house, so I can't get away from them, you know. So there's nowhere to sit. It's a banjo or a man or something. So I walk through my house, and I pick it up, and then, you know, then I keep playing. I, I play for at least an hour a day, and a lot of the days I'm playing a show for more than an hour, so that's kind of a paid rehearsal. Man. And is there advice, Don, you'd have for like younger musicians? I mean, is practice the important part, or is it the passion for the music? Oh, it's both. Well, the passion drives you to practice. Yeah, yeah, and they both got to go together. You got to really want it, because that's, you know, because um, that's what you're going to spend a lot of time doing. M more than an hour a day. I, I, I hang around him a fair amount. <laughs> so you he, know. He, yeah, I would say it's on the more part of that more than an hour a day. Yeah. Um, but, but no, it's got to be something that you really love and you got to be so passionate about it that you want to find out, you know, what makes it tick and what makes this player sound like this or what makes this music sound like this. And it's a lifelong study. It's boundaryless, you know. Yeah. There's no, you know. So, uh, so I think it's a combination, you know. Once you find the right person, that music is it, and then they just spend their life doing it, then that's the, that's the language. I think that's what, what we have in common. We're 30-some years apart age-wise, but I think we both are just so into music, and we both are just into it. And, and, you know, I imagine that means when you're on the road a lot and you've been on the road a lot, what do you guys listen to in the car, or do you play in the car? All right. John Hartford. <laughs> Uh, the we Stanley listening. Brothers. We were listening to John Hartford when we pulled in the parking lot. Perfect. <laughs> Mostly a lot of John Hartford, man, because, I don't know, there's something about his, like, he'll just mix it up with some poetry and stuff, and when you're just driving for six hours, man, we listen to a lot of John Hartford. And Stanley Brothers and Bill Monroe, you know? Kanye the, West doesn't come on the speakers at any point. <laughs> well, no, no. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I don't think it that does, hurts. no. No, sometimes when we unplug the iPod, it might be on a station or something. Ah, turn that shit on. Uh, and how do you explain the Traverse City thing? Because a lot of people will say, Where, how does a bluegrass band like this come out of Traverse City? I mean, I understand it because I've seen a lot of rootsy music acts coming out of that area, but there is something going on up there with the water or something because I'm seeing some amazing musicians I up moved there. up there, man. <laughs> yep. Yeah. People are. We're, we're attracting people. We're attract. I, I'm an old time local from there, and and there's always been a good amount of players up there. But I think when the economy shifted over the last few years, and now that the dust is settling, Traverse City's looking like a good place for uh, musicians to be. So now we got some of the stepping in it guys moving up there. And, oh yeah. You know. So some of the more powerful, you know, popular musicians in the state have decided that Traverse City is where they want to be, which only fuels the scene that us locals have been trying to keep going for the last 20, 30 years. It's now, now it's becoming a cool place. So, so don't be surprised to see anything come out of Traverse City. It's, Man, Traverse City is awesome. It's, it's great. Do you guys feel like you're ambassadors for that area and for Michigan in particular when you get outside the state? I don't know what that word means. What, like a, <laughs> Representing. Oh, you know, the state. yeah. Yeah, I love to, man. Of course, when we're on tour across the country, we're saying we're from Michigan, you know, we're from northern Michigan, we're, you know. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you guys somebody re- actually last night I was at this kind of party, man, and this kid said, "Hey, I li- I used, to, you know, I'm from Traverse City, and uh, I have all sorts of people that come up to me and give me compliments and stuff." But he said, "Man, thanks for doing Traverse City a solid." <laughs> And I never heard that before. This happened last night. It kind of was, blew my mind a little bit. I never heard that. You know, you're welcome. <laughs> so you guys recently signed with a national booking agency, uh, crossover touring. So I'm guessing you've got a very busy year ahead. Uh, what's in store for 2015? Because I know you've already been booked for some pretty big festivals, and I'm sure there's a lot of touring ahead. Well, um, when we pulled in the driveway tonight, um, the email was Gray Fox. So yeah. we're doing so, uh, lots of... Uh, festivals across the country. This we're hitting the festival circuit pretty hard. We're you know Rocky Grass. We're doing Del Fest. We're doing uh, just Romp Wintergrass. Yeah, we're doing a bunch of them, and we're really excited about that. You know, uh, looking at our names on the flyers with all of our heroes, like we were talking about earlier, is kind of just like whoa, really? So we'll see when we get there. You know what happens, but no, we're on the road to Del Fest, man. And, and interestingly, I think festivals are great for musicians like you guys because you get a chance to finally rub elbows with a lot of our artists rather than doing your own little gigs where you may not get a chance to see these other guys. Right. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's great. It's great to see, you know, to be able to hang out backstage and, you know, to meet, you know, your heroes and the people it's that are... It's kind of bizarre, you know, to think that I'm friends with some of these guys who I worshipped when I was 10 years old. And my, and my dad, you know, worshipped his whole life, you know. I remember specifically a time when my father brought me into the room and said, sit down, man. This is David Grisman, and he put on a record, and it, it was like a big deal. Now, let make a point. David Grisman does play the mandolin. <laughs> yes, he does. Well, and very so, well, I mean. Just so you all know. Yeah. Now, what do you guys think of all the adulation you guys have gotten in a short period of time? I mean, getting Tab to play the Ann Arbor Folk Festival, getting into these other festivals that you're talking about. You guys have had some glowing praise from some big publications across the country. I cannot believe it. We are lucky. I don't even know how to express how grateful I am for all of the encouragement and... uh, and and the recent, you know, it's just been been crazy. We've only been doing this for a couple years together, and... We work hard. We work very hard on all of it, you know. We don't, man, we probably spend more time on the other stuff than the music, you know. But <laughs> but we, I, I don't know. It, I'm blown away. I, I can just say thank you, and that's all. All right, let's hear something else. And after this song, we'll uh, take some questions from the audience. So prepare yourselves out there. All right, man, here's another brand new one. One, two, one, two, three.
swear there are times, and you guys can raise the hair on the back of my neck when you guys get rolling. Um, do you have a description for your technique or how you play guitar in terms of the kind of style that you have? Well, flat picking is what they call it, and because I use a flat pick, it's just flat. See, it's not curvy or nothing. Uh, mostly just going up and down on the strings. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's that technique. There you go. Yeah, they're, going they're, up and down the technique. strings. And yeah. other than local spins live at River City, what's been your favorite concert experience till now? Obviously, it's been two years of fun. Man, there's just too many to name. You know, you can't. I mean, from the West Coast to the East Coast, we've had some cool parties, man, and it's that's just pretty been... cool. Just last Saturday night here in Grand Rapids at the at the uh, Winter uh, Wheat Winter Wheat at the intersection. That was awesome. Yeah, oh, man. Every, you can't even say <laughs> Wheatland. You know, Wheatland is great to us. We love Wheatland Music Organization and everything that they do over there, and uh, everything. Do you think it's important for musicians such as yourselves to support other groups from this yes. area? Because the camaraderie that I see in West Michigan in particular among Grand Rapids groups, Traverse City groups, everybody's collaborating with everybody else, and everybody wants to see everyone else succeed. You know, that's a, you're, you got it, man. You nailed it. It's a, it's a huge family, you know, not just in Michigan, across the country and probably the globe, you know, it's a... It's a common language, you know. You get together with five dudes who you'd never met before, and they all play bluegrass, so it's like a fun thing that we can do, you know. And, and uh, no, there's a huge network of friends and musicians, and we all help each other, of course. Yeah, it's just, you know, um, it's crazy. It's, it's really awesome. We, we support all of our friends, you know, and, and, and vice versa. Yeah. In fact, there's a big conference coming up in February called the Folk Alliance International right. Conference, and it'll be in Kansas City. Dude, I can't wait. And for and, Folk and we've arranged a Michigan we've arranged a Michigan room so that we can do just that. We have our showcases, and we can try to attract agents and record companies and festival promoters and all those people into our room, which there'll be. Us, of course, and uh, Laith El Sadi and, yep. the, and the Crane Wives. The Ragbirds. And the Ragbirds yeah. and Lindsay Lou. And, uh, Great bunch. Yeah. What are we going to call it? The Michigan It's, the Michi it's just showcase. the Michigan Roots Showcase yeah, Room, but we're going to, and Red Tail Ring, Red too. Tail ring, but yeah, we're going to go try to represent Michigan mm -hmm. on a pretty international level. As well you should. All right, I want to take some questions from the audience, uh, stuff maybe you're seeing from this performance, maybe stuff you really want to ask them. Uh, a few questions, just, just let them know. Guys, if you would, uh, by the way, wonderful, man. It's great being here with you. Uh, would you introduce your bass player again? Mr. Kevin Gills on the bass tonight. Hey, Kevin. That's right, yeah, we picked him up. And Kevin, what's your background? How did you get hooked up with these two guys? Well, uh, actually, um, my background has a lot to do with uh, Mr. Don Julin. I've played a lot of different music in Traverse City over the years. And uh, we had a group back in the mid-90s called Big Swifty and Associates, which was, uh, no, that's a real thing. And uh, yeah, which that one of us was Big Swifty? Well, <laughs> back then you were the bigger Swifty, but I've, I'm catching up. I do what I can. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we did that stuff, and that was actually one of my first introductions. I was a rock and roll guy. I grew up playing, you know, along with all those Led Zeppelin records and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, we had listened to a lot of other cool music. By then, I was interested in a lot of stuff, but that was the first chance I had to, uh, you know, branch out professionally and play a little jazz and a little folk music and a lot of other different kinds of stuff. But you forgot to tell them that one of the main things that Big Swifty, hold on, if you get to a microphone. Yeah, you can. One of the, one of the, one of the main things Big Swifty was known for was we did a lot of Frank Zappa covers on a Well, that was the common instrument. denominator. So. There was a couple of us rock so. and roll guys, and there was a couple jazz guys, and there were a couple of folk guys. But the thing that we all had in common is we love Frank Zappa, and we hated not being in a band where people would pay attention long enough to learn those songs and how complicated they are. So we'd get together at Don's house and practice for a few hours and go home with our notes. So you really and, cut your teeth by playing Frank Zappa. That's how you became such a great bluegrass player. <laughs> well, that so. helped. Uh, yeah, you know. I, think that, I think that helps a lot. So, so Kevin, <laughs> you know, you've sort of got a more objective viewpoint joining these guys and sitting back there and watching them. What is your impression of these two dudes? Uh, well, it goes back to when Bill first came to Traverse City. You know, he kind of blew everyone's hair back even then. He was playing around with a bunch of our different friends. And I remember when he and Don first got together... I play up in Traverse City a lot with a fellow named Joe Wilson. Oh, 
And uh, we have a duo called the True Falsettos. And we got together with these guys and did a few shows where we'd play and then they'd play. And then the four of us would come out and just mash together for a little while at the end. And uh, I think there was one time when Don had a solo spot somewhere else. So we grabbed Billy and threw him in the van and took him down to Fenton to some barbecue to play some bluegrass. Oh, Remember that? <laughs> yeah. Dang. Yep. So, yeah, we, you know, we all hang around in the same town. You mentioned that Traverse City is, you know, one of those kind of places where people want to see each other succeed. We like hanging out together. You know, we like the same kinds of stuff. And for me, you know, I've been playing with Joe for a long time and doing a lot of other stuff. And Don and I had talked last summer, you know, Joe's hanging around town a little bit more. He's got a young family and a lot of the other guys I know do as well. And Don was like, you know, we could use a hand out on the road, you know, maybe for this and maybe for that. And, you know, I can handle doing a little sound. I've done that, you know, for a living in the meantime, too. And driving the van is no problem. And helping found out a way to fit the bass in the and bass. i you know that was the clincher you know once they found out a way to fit the bass in there then it was real easy but yeah no i've been watching these guys do a lot of these you know as you mentioned the big festivals and stuff like that so i definitely uh leapt at the chance to climb in the van and start learning some bluegrass tunes it's music i've always loved and listened to since i was a kid and it's one of the few kinds of music i've never had the opportunity to play on a professional level you know, we'd go do our other gigs and then sit around and play bluegrass yeah. on the beach afterwards. You guys were playing 300 chords to three people, and now you're playing three chords to 300 people. That's the way it should work. Yeah. So so anyways, yeah, it was just sort of a matter of being in the right place in the right time, I guess, more than anything else. And, you know, again, being friends with Don didn't hurt. You know, we've had a lot of stuff go on over the years, and always, I've always, I remember even, you know, when I was just learning how to play jazz after Big Swifty had kind of dissolved and I had a young family and I was thinking about that rock and roll retirement plan and you know how to keep things moving but stay within a certain radius of town and I remember calling Don and saying you know I think I need to take some jazz lessons so that I know what I need to know to be useful to guys like you and uh, get some gigs around town and around that same time I got an upright bass I started playing in an old uh, swing band and that was the other big catalyst you know starting to play more acoustic music and learning my way around on this as opposed to the old pork chop. And as a stand-up bassist, you always have to measure your vehicles before you purchase them, right? Yep. So, so here you got a, a rocker, kind of a jazz guy, and a bluegrass guy all coming together to play this great music. Yeah, the Michigan stew. Uh, anybody else out here? Uh, go ahead. Tell us about your instruments. What guitar, what mandolin, what bass do you play? And is that, did you inherit it? Did you buy it all right uh, how'd you get it my guitar uh, i've had it for a couple of years now and this one was built by a fellow named roy noble he builds you know he used to build guitars and he built about 20 guitars a year starting in 1959 and this is one of his and uh didn't clarence play one of his guitars right yeah clarence played one of his and uh and uh, it's just a really great guitar a lot of people say and eh, it's a nice martin you got it's built kind of after a martin mahogany spruce top handmade guitar can't beat it man so do you have a backup on the road in case what's that a backup i sure do yeah i bring two guitars and the bass is actually real easy to describe it's a frechner german student bass just a plywood job that i found at elderly i went down there and they had four or five of them in the back room and uh, actually it's kind of a funny story there's a guy named phil wintermute who you might remember from the earthwork collective and all that he worked at elderly and he was probably pushing 60 at the time and weighed all of 120 pounds. And if you know elderly instruments, they have a ballroom upstairs that's actually instrument storage. And I sent him upstairs for all five upright basses that they had. You know, he'd come back, oh, okay, that's, you sure there's no more? Well, there is one. You know, he'd go oh, back up the stairs, buddy, you know. So he brought it down and, uh, yeah, it's nothing special really. You know, just a student bass from the early 60s or late 50s. But uh, yeah. it has taken a beating and it serves me well. Yeah. And Don's mandolin was uh, built by a guy named Mike Kimnitzer, and it, he grew it. And Mike grew it out of the ground. It's a nugget. <laughs> yeah, it says Gibson on the headstock, but if you're a mandolin aficionado, it would be interesting to know that it's really not a Gibson. It's a fake. Um, but normally you would assume a fake would be, you know, an inferior copy. And as it turns out, the guy who built this mandolin is uh, Mike Kimnitzer of Nugget Mandolins, who makes some of the finest mandolins available at any price, anywhere. So it's worth more money, the fact that it's a Gibson, that it's, or that it's a Nugget, than it would have been a Gibson. It's actually it was built in 1979. Um, 
it's a great bluegrass mandolin. And uh, I guess bluegrass mandolins are supposed to say Gibson. I guess that's why he did that. <laughs> he wouldn't do that today. If you ordered one from him today, they do not say Gibson on there. But... Well, we want to hear some more good stuff. We're have <laughs> We'd one love more... to pick a couple yes. more tunes for you guys. That's I, right. I know that. We go, we go right ahead and play a couple more songs, and then we'll wrap it up. So, Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us today, and we'll see you all around, man. Uh, again, this is Don Julian here on the mandolin, and that's Kevin Gills on the bass. I'm Billy, and here we go. Yep. One, two, and away we go. Thank you. 
good. I get the feeling that we have time for one more song if you guys can uh, manage to squeeze one in. And I have to say something that your voice is so perfect for what you're singing. I mean, you, I mean, you really have a twang that's perfect for this kind of music. Thank you very much. I mean, it's not Where does it come from? Uh, <laughs> Ionia. <laughs> I own your twang. I guess. Doesn't everybody if I own you sing like that? I guess, sure. I guess it's from my mom or God or something. Somebody gave me something. Well, you're perfect for this. So yeah, one more song. Maybe we'll do one more thing. We'll we'll, we'll finish could, this could, up. We got a couple more minutes. Can we do something that isn't uh, public domain? At Absolutely. Point? You want to play? Man. Let's do one. Let's do one of them brothers tunes. Pick one. Uh, pick one. Or no, just like select one. <laughs> oh, when you say pick, it means several things in bluegrass parlance. Long gone. Hold on, let me, let me retune. Talk to him for a second. I beat, yeah. it, I beat it out cool. of tune on that last We'll do this one more tune. Again, thank you guys for coming out and <clears throat> hanging out with us today. Yeah. We, uh, we love you. Thank you very much. We'll try to do this one. Uh, I learned from Reno and Smiley. Little thing called Long Gone. Continue their hectic gigging schedule. They're actually on their way to shows in Iowa, Illinois, and Minnesota over the next several days. But if you're pumped up after tonight's performance, you can catch them back in Michigan a week from tonight at Traverse City's Little Bohemia, where they play regularly. Followed on Friday night by a stop at Shorts Brewery in Bel Air, and who doesn't want to be there? And as I said before, they play the Ann Arbor Folk Festival on January 30th, and they'll be back in Grand Rapids to play at the WYCE Jammy Awards at the intersection on February 13th. An amazing night of local and regional music. If you've never checked that out, I'm sure most of you have. 
There's more than 20 bands performing, and they'll be one of them. Uh, for more information, you can visit their website at billystrings.com. Billy and Don also have merchandise and CDs for sale out in the lobby. And adding to that excitement, there's also Local Spins T-shirts for sales out there. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank yeah, Billy and Don and Kevin for making the trip down. The weather was beautiful and perfect for your trip today, so I'm ver very happy about that. Being part of the special nights, thank you all of you in the audience and the folks at River City Studios. Keep an eye on localspins.com over the next couple of weeks. We will have the video and the podcast up along with a story over the next week or so. You can follow us on Twitter and at look at Facebook for updates at Local Spins. Thanks again and have a fabulous evening. Woo!